The sights and the sounds of yoga and mantras being repeated were common experiences of the flower child generation of the 1960s and the 70s. The culture of the United States of America was being seriously influenced by transcendental meditation and Maharishi Masha Yogi. Currently, the TM movement claims to have over 6 million adherents worldwide with noted celebrities such as the late John Lennon of the Beatles and the musician the late Michael Jackson. As a reaction to the TM incursion, fundamentalist and evangelical denominations adamantly rejected all forms of meditation. From the pulpits, radio and TV, the warning was clear. Christians should not be involved with meditation. Is there any form of meditation acceptable to Christianity? Should Christians be involved in meditation? We read in the Bible, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. Nearly all Christians realize the importance of meditating the scriptures. They realize that there is a clear mandate given in the scriptures to meditate the word of God day and night. The psalmist, King David, also encouraged his readers to meditate on the person of God and on his works. In fact, in Psalm 119 alone, there are six references to meditation of God's holy scriptures. This may be the case, but how do we meditate the scriptures? This is the question of the hour. What is Bible meditation? Bible meditation is not an exercise which can be conducted in 30 second time slots. True Bible meditation is a function which could encompass day and night. Most Christians back away from Bible meditation at this point because they associate the word meditation with mystic chants and mantra humming. But this is not the case. Bible meditation is a technique that once learned is a central part of Bible research. It is easy for me to associate Bible meditation with being a detective. The function of a detective is to investigate crime in order to solve its mystery. We all have seen TV shows where forensic scientists sift through meager evidence in order to discover the perpetrators of the crime. District attorneys use the evidence assembled by the detectives and forensic experts in order to assemble their case for jury preparation. Sloppy investigation technique could result in cases being lost due to human error. Good investigation technique must assemble clues in a logical fashion, and the proper chain of evidence must be maintained in order to preserve the integrity of the evidence. It might surprise all of us how many cases are lost in court due to sloppy casework. Picture with me the possibility that the diligent student of the Word should be a scriptural detective. When the student of the Word seeks to meditate the Word of God, he or she should approach the scriptures with the attitude of a detective. The goal of the scriptural detective is to find scriptural clues that will establish a solid testimony for their verse. It is so important that you preserve the context of the scripture and establish a clear chain of scriptural evidence to support your conclusion. All good investigations include four facets. 
and these techniques are planning. You must plan the scriptural investigation you wish to conduct. Gathering evidence. We must gather evidence searching the scriptures for clues that clarify our investigation. During this part of the investigation, you should also seek to bridge the four canyons of Bible research noted in episode two. Analysis and evaluation. You must analyze and evaluate all the various clues you have assembled during your scriptural investigation. The last facet is decision making. Finally, you must make a decision about the evidence gathered. Remember, a casual investment of time in your scriptural investigation will reap casual results. Now let's consider the secret to Bible meditation. Successful Bible meditation is built on the technique of changing your point of perspective. Let's say that I was standing in the middle of a room and I had four people positioned around me, one on my left, one on my right, one in front of me, and one behind me. On my direction, I asked each person to describe the part of me they saw. Each person would see a different portrait of me based on his or her point of perspective. Should each person believe they had the total picture of me, they would be sadly mistaken. In order to gain an accurate picture, you must combine the testimony of all four individuals. In simple terms, you must consider each point of perspective in order to develop a three-dimensional picture of me. You must handle the Word of God in the same fashion. The scriptures are not one-dimensional, but they have many facets and applications. In fact, the Bible is multidimensional. The secret to successful Bible meditation is found in your ability to change your point of perspective. The techniques that will be demonstrated are designed to change your point of perspective during your Bible study. The normal method of Bible meditation is to ponder for a few moments the proper application of the topic being studied. Let's call this approach meditating your topic from the positive perspective. The secret to this method is to change your approach and meditate your topic from the negative perspective. What do I mean by this? The positive method is to ponder what your topic is communicating, while the negative method is to ponder what your topic is not communicating. In simple terms, with the negative method, you seek to identify the opposite application of your study topic. The goal of this technique is to read between the lines. Let's try a few examples. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The same verse in the New American Standard Version. But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even as from the Lord the Spirit. Notice that I use different translations. This is a good practice to embrace. Now let's apply the positive negative method of Bible meditation. What does it mean to have an open, unveiled face? This metaphor could represent an open, transparent relationship with God. With the positive method, you might conclude that those who seek God with an open, transparent relationship will be changed into the same image of Christ they experience. With this positive use in mind, what would the negative application of this metaphor communicate? With the negative method, you might conclude that those who seek God with a closed face, veiled in vain religion, false fronts, and self-deception will frustrate the image of Christ being formed in them. 
Now let's consider another example. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The New International Version. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And the New American Standard Version. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. With the positive method, you might conclude that those who seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness will walk in God's prosperity and provision. But with the negative method, you might conclude that those who fail to seek first God and his kingdom will not enjoy the benefits of his prosperity and provision. This can be a sobering thought when your Christian experience is filled with constant frustration. The positive-negative method of Bible meditation will take some practice, but once you develop the technique, you will find it easy and effective. You will find that this method of Bible meditation is the foundation of all the techniques you will learn during this episode. The second method of Bible meditation is to identify the keywords in your study topic. With this method, you identify the keywords that give your topic action and direction. Simply stated, you look for the verbs in your Bible reference. For example, Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. As you ponder this verse, four words will stand out, and these words are reckon, dead, alive, and through. These words give this verse action and direction. I can hear the shouts already. You did not include Jesus. That is true. I purposely did not include Jesus because he is the noun of the verse, not the verb. With these verbs identified, apply the positive-negative method of meditation. Another application of this method is to identify the synonyms and the antonyms of your key words. This form of scripture investigation fits well with the positive-negative method since a synonym is a word having the same or almost the same meaning while an antonym is a word that is opposite of another in meaning. The question I can hear being asked, how can I discover a word's synonyms or antonyms? There are two options. You may use your Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and locate the colon and dash symbol in the Hebrew or Greek definition of your study word. Every word that appears after this symbol is the various ways your study word was translated in the King James Version of the Bible. Usually these words are synonyms of your study topic. You may also use Roget's Thesaurus to identify valid synonyms and some antonyms of your study topic. The third method of Bible meditation is based on the simple philosophical principle first presented by Aristotle known as the law of cause and effect. Cause and effect is the relationship between two objects when one object makes something else happen. Looking for the reason why things happen is a basic human drive. We do want to understand the effects caused by our actions. The Greek philosopher Aristotle said, All causes of things are beginnings that we have scientific knowledge when we know the cause, that is, to know a thing's existence is to know the reason why it is. Sir Isaac Newton carried this assumption to its next logical conclusion in his third physical law of motion when he said, to every action there is always opposed an equal reaction. These laws state that with every action there is a cause and effect, 
and there is an equal and opposing reaction. You can also use these scientific principles to conduct Bible meditation. Simply stated, every action you see produced by your study topic will have an equal and opposing reaction. Students of journalism are also taught the writing method of observing cause and effect in the articles they read and write. The journalists use this technique to identify potential causes of a problem in an orderly fashion. These students are taught to look for certain adverbs that produce cause and effect. The words or phrases they are taught to identify include because, since, as long as, as, inasmuch as, due to the fact that, and therefore. This method works well with the keyword technique since your goal is to establish cause and effect in your study topic. Again, look for the verbs and the adverbs in your Bible reference that produce action. One question you might ask yourself when reviewing your study topic is, what condition is necessary to cause the result noted? In order to be successful with this method, you should seek to establish spiritual motive, cause and effect in action and reaction. Seek to discover what causes your topic to function, what effect the topic has on the truth of God and the spiritual action and reaction that will be produced in your life by your study topic. For example, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Simply stated, the cause and effect method seeks to identify the sowing and reaping principle of your study topic. With this scriptural reference, let's put these logical methods to work. Some thoughts you might conclude are, Whatever action you sow, you will reap the obvious reaction. Should you do things the same way, do not be surprised when you reap the same result. Here's another thought. Self-deception will blind you to the results of your actions. But the clincher to the sowing and reaping principle is found in this thought. Every action of the flesh and spirit will produce a reaction. Should the action be directed toward the flesh, you will reap death. But should the action be directed toward the Spirit, you will reap eternal life. You cannot plant wheat seed and expect to reap a harvest of corn. Wheat produces wheat, while corn produces corn. This may seem simple, but in fact, this simple truth reaffirms the scientific laws of cause and effect and action and reaction. God is a God of natural law, when you meditate the scriptures, you seek to identify the natural laws that influenced your study topic. The final method of Bible meditation is based on the normal journalistic approach to writing. This method is known as the fundamental 5 W's technique of journalistic writing news reporting, research, and in police investigations. This technique is a formula for getting the full story on something. Journalistic students are taught that in order for a report to be complete, it must answer a checklist of six questions, each of which comprises an interrogative word. The six interrogative words are who, what, when, where, why, and the optional how. The principle behind this maxim is that each question should elicit a factual answer since a yes or no answer will not answer the investigative question. Even though this material is a basic writing technique, a good investigator will read his or her material with the intent of extracting these facts. This journalistic approach lends itself well to the discipline of Bible meditation. When you use this method in Bible meditation, 
You seek to identify who, what, when, where, and why of your study topic. Let's consider an example. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The five W's are who. God is the central theme of this verse. What. This verse is dealing with the topic of faith. When. We will please God when we, in faith, draw near to him with diligence. Where. During times of prayer and Bible meditation, you seek the face of the Lord. Why? You seek the Lord with faith. This attitude and action pleases the Lord, and He rewards those who diligently seek Him and His presence. During these times of Bible meditation, do not forget to consider how your study topic relates and functions with the subject context. Recently, while sharing these techniques with my son, he noted that my Bible meditation techniques used a scientific approach to analytical thinking. I conceded this point because his perception is true. Bible meditation is more about teaching yourself to think in a logical fashion than conducting 30-second muses while staring at an open Bible. Each of these techniques are designed to change your point of perspective and open up new arenas of revelation and insight. These methods presented are not an end in themselves. Without the illumination of the Holy Spirit, the truth of Scripture will not be open to you. When you change your point of perspective with these Bible meditation methods, you are providing the Holy Spirit with the fertile breeding ground for scriptural illumination.